This is Amanda Welch welcoming you to this Bite Size Bio web seminar, which today is sponsored by Twist Bioscience. Twist oligo pools are highly accurate with an industry leading one to a thousand nuclear error, nucleotide error rate, allowing you to clone into expression vectors to generate libraries of single guide RNAs. Our silicon based technology allows for more representation, giving you efficient screens to accelerate your research. Enjoy accuracy now at the right price. Now, today's presentation is titled Discovering PARP Inhibitor Resistance Mechanisms Using Genome-Wide and Focused CRISPR Screens. It's being presented by Dr. Stephen Pettit, who is a staff scientist at the Institute of Cancer Research in London. Stephen is now a staff scientist at the Breast Cancer Now Toby Robbins Research Center at the Institute of Cancer Research. He completed his PhD in 2010 under the supervision of Professor Alan Bradley, the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute. During his PhD, he developed methods for high throughput genetic screens in mouse embryonic stem cells. Stephen joined the group of Professor Alan Ashworth and Professor Chris Lord at the Institute of Cancer Research as a postdoc, where he used genetic screens to reveal the mechanism of action of PARP inhibitors and other inhibitors of components of the DNA damage response. He employs a range of cutting edge experimental genetic approaches and DNA sequencing to investigate drug resistance and sensitivity in cancer and uses genetic screens to identify synthetic lethal interactions with tumor suppressor genes. Now, as always, we will have a question and answer session after the presentation. So please type any questions that you have into the questions box, which appears on the right-hand side of your screen, and I'll put them to Stephen at the end. The recording of the webinar will be available at bit.ly slash PARP webinar. That's bit.ly slash PARP webinar, all one word, lowercase. So now over to you, Stephen, for the presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Amanda. Um, yep, yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to this webinar. Um, so I'm I'm Steve Petter. I'm working in Chris Lord's lab now here at the Institute of Cancer Research in London. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to start by thanking Twist and Bites Bio for this opportunity to present some of our work to you today. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about two different CRISPR screening methods that we've been using in the lab to study resistance to a class of drugs that we're particularly interested in here, uh, which are called PARP inhibitors. So I appreciate there's probably a, a fairly wide uh, range of backgrounds of audience here. So I'll introduce uh, PARP inhibitors and CRISPR screens before we start the webinar. Um, so I'll, um, I'll start by explaining some of the background about PARP inhibitors and why we're interested in PARP inhibitors. So PARP stands for poly ADP ribose polymerase. Um, and there are various different PARP uh, family members in the cell, but for the purposes of this talk and for generally when we're talking about PARP inhibitors in cancer, we're mostly interested in PARP1, which is the most abundant uh, PARP in the cell. So PARP1 is expressed um, at very high levels in the nucleus, and it's um, involved in various different um, processes in the cell. But uh, yeah, the, the one of most interest to cancer is its role in DNA repair. So on this slide, you can see this kind of cycle of PARP um, and how it's how it acts as a sensor and a mediator of DNA repair. So if we start at the top here with point one, you can see this, the protein structure of part one is this kind of beads on a string model. So at the end terminus here, we have this zinc finger to DNA binding domain comprised of uh, three zinc finger domains. Then in the middle, we have the BRCT domain and the WGR domain, which um, I'll come on to later in the talk. These are some uh, domains important for the, for the function of part one. Uh, and then finally, at the C-terminus, we have the actual catalytic domain of PARP1, which is um, which uh, conducts this polymerization reaction. And there's an auto-inhibitory helical domain, HD, here, um, which under more normal circumstances is folded up against the catalytic domain, inactivating PARP activity. So PARP's canonical role in DNA repair is as a sensor of single-stranded DNA damage. Uh, so PARP1 binds extremely fast to sites of single-stranded DNA breaks in the cell uh, within sort of milliseconds. Um, and the sort of first stage of binding is this DNA, is the zinc finger domains, which assemble on the site of the, the single-stranded break. You can then, then see as following the start cycle round here, uh, that the rest of the domains of part one then fold up against the zinc finger domains. Um, and this induces a conformational change uh, in the helical domain, which activates part one. Um, so now part one can bind its substrate, beta NAD, um, and start to produce these PAR polymers. Uh, so Poly-ADP ribose, we usually abbreviate to PAR, and we refer to this process of polymerization as parallelation. So PARP1 uh, produces 
poly PARP um, polymers on its um, on its substrate proteins, and these include DNA repair factors that actually carry out the repair of this break, such as XRCC1. But the other main activity of PARP1 is actually autoparylation. So PARP modifies itself, um, and this mod modification occurs on the BRCT domain and, and elsewhere. And it's thought that by modifying uh, itself in this way and building up these long chains of polyADP ribose polymers, uh, this results in a big steric buildup of negative charge, which promotes the dissociation of PARP1 from the DNA. And that allows this cycle to start again. And there are also um, PAR glycohydrase enzymes in the cell, which will remove this, um, this parylation. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, on the next slide, just sum summarize this slightly more simply, that PARP is a sort of sensor and a mediator of DNA um, damage repair, particularly at sites of single-stranded DNA damage. So why is this important for, um, for cancer? So we, we were, I, I work in a breast cancer research lab here, and we're particularly interested in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 tumor suppressor genes, which cause um, a hereditary predisposition syndrome to breast in ovarian cancer. Um, so on this slide, I'm just going to explain the rationale for using PARP in this in cancers with mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2. So um, the original hypothesis was that if you inhibited PARP1, you would overload the cells with unrepaired single-stranded DNA damage. Um, and then when the cells divide and go into S phase and a replication fork comes along and hits this single-stranded DNA break, um, this damage will then be converted into a double-strand break. And this is a particular particularly toxic kind of double strand break because this is single ended when it occurs at replication fork. There's, there's nowhere obvious to join this break to. Um, so these kind of replication forks that stall in this way uh, absolutely require homologous recombination pathway uh, to restart the replication fork and to continue um, replicating the cell's DNA and, and dividing. Um, so this process is dependent on the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. So the thinking is that if you inhibit PARP1, and you accumulate a lot of unrepaired single-stranded DNA damage, um, normal cells will be able to repair this fine in S phase because they have an intact homologous recombination pathway. But if we have a tumor cell which has a mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2, um, this cell will, will, will not be able to deal with this damage and will die. So yeah, the, the hypothesis was that inhibiting PARP1 would make the cells very, very dependent on a functional homologous recombination pathway. Um, and so you can see some evidence of that in this slide from uh, one of our lab's early papers on PARP inhibitors. Where, um, so this is showing a survival curve of uh, BRCA2 mutant mouse embryonic stem cells treated um, with a PARP inhibitor. And so what you can see is the BRCA2 mutant cells are very, very sensitive to this PARP inhibitor, you know, about 100 to 1,000 times more sensitive than either the wild type or the heterozygous um, counterparts. So what that means is that this could be a potential treatment for uh, BRCA2 mutant tumors because you'd be able to specifically kill the tumor cells which will have lost BRCA2 function completely, but not the wild type or the heterozygous carrier cells of the rest of the patient. Um, and yeah, since this, since these observations, PARP1, PARP, PARP inhibitors have now been developed in, um, in both breast and ovarian cancer as treatments for, for cancer. But going back to this PARP uh, catalytic cycle um, for a moment, there's another kind of implication of this um, cycle of PARP, uh, PARP activity that I was explaining. So um, I mentioned that the original binding of PARP1 to the site of single-stranded DNA damage occurs by the zinc finger domains and doesn't require the catalytic activity. Um, and also that the catalytic activity is required to dissociate PARP1 from the DNA. So that means that there's a kind of potential that you would end up with this in the presence of a PARP inhibitor where you'll actually get PARP1 able to bind to the site of damage but not to complete this cycle and dissociate. Um, and this is kind of referred to as the trapping hypothesis of how uh, PARP inhibitors work. So, um, you know, perhaps when we treat with the cells with the PARP inhibitors such as elaparib, as well as, you know, not repairing this single strand of DNA damage, we might end up with some kind of hypothetical structure like this, where we have PARP1 with the inhibitor bounds stably associated with the site of damage. And it might be that this uh, PARP DNA complex is very, very toxic to the cells. Um, and some evidence for that comes from some previous work that we did and also from lots of work by Yves Pommier's group, um, where we showed that if you, um, if you do a transposon screen uh, to try and isolate PARP inhibitor resistant mutants uh, in wild type homologous recombination proficient cells, uh, you often get resistant mutants that have lost PARP1 expression. And you can see that these mutants are very, very resistant to the cytotoxic effects of PARP inhibitors such as elaparib. Um, so what this is telling you is that 
actually, if you delete part one completely, uh, the cells the cells grow fine. Um, and this is much, much less toxic than treating the cells with the PARP inhibitor. So this implies that PARP1 itself is required for much of the cytotoxic effects of PARP inhibitors. And that supports this hypothesis that PARP1 protein is actually a component of the toxic lesion. And it's not just the lack of uh, PARP activity mediating single-stranded uh, DNA repair that is killing the cells. So the final thing to introduce about PARP inhibitors is just some of the some of the drugs that I'll be talking about during this, the rest of this um, webinar. So um, on the right of this slide, you can see five different PARP inhibitors, um, which are the, the most advanced clinical uh, PARP inhibitory compounds. Um, so three of these are now FDA approved for treatment of cancer. Um, Alaparib, Recaparib, and Niraparib are all approved for uh, maintenance therapy in uh, BRCA mutant high-grade serous ovarian cancer. Uh, and Alaparib has also recently been approved for BRCA mutant triple negative breast cancer. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to talk uh, mostly about alaparib and also about uh, talazoparib, which is a new generation of PARP inhibitors. Um, and talazoparib is an interesting drug because uh, although all these five PARP inhibitors are quite good catalytic activities, catalytic, sorry, catalytic inhibitors of uh, PARP enzymatic activity, um, talazoparib shows, relatively speaking, a much stronger uh, potency to trap PARP1 at sites of DNA damage. Um, and I'll show some more data on that later in the talk. And uh, the other outlier on this sort of trapping potency scale is viliparib, which um, although it's a good enzymatic activity, a good inhibitor of PARP's enzymatic activity, uh, it seems to cause relatively much less trapping than the other drugs. Um, and it's not really clear yet if this is um, sort of relevant in the clinic or not, um, but this is yeah, an interesting um, sort of differences between these drugs. So as I mentioned, um, we are seeing more and more patients now who have received PARP inhibitors as, as cancer treatments, both as part of the trials to develop these drugs and now also in routine clinical practice. And it's clear that resistance to these inhibitors will um, eventually develop in many cases. Um, so, so far, the only kind of um, well-established clinical mechanism of PARP inhibitor resistance is by reversion of the BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. So what that means is... Uh, these mutations that we see in patients in BRCA1 or BRCA2 are often frame shift mutations that put the protein out of frame. And sometimes in the resistance uh, setting, you'll see a compensating frame shift mutation that will put the mutation, put the gene back into frame and restore homologous recombination function to the cell. Um, so this is one way that we know cells can become resistant to the inhibitors, but there's also um, many unexplained cases of resistance as well. So uh, that that's really the main, was the main question of this study that I'll be talking about today is how how can cells become resistant to PARP inhibitors? So I'll talk about kind of three approaches we've taken to that. Uh, so the first was a CRISPR screen for to try and discover new PARP inhibitor resistance mechanisms. In um, this was done in homologous recombination proficient cells um, originally, and we've since we've since repeated that in BRCA1 mutant cells as well. Um, so this could th this was a genome wide CRISPR screen and could potentially identify new mediators of of PARP inhibitor resistance. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll talk in more, more detail about PARP1 mediated resistance um, and different mutations in PARP1 that can cause resistance. So that's, um, that's the introduction to PARP. And um, now I'm just going to uh, briefly introduce CRISPR mutagenesis. Um, so again, I'm sure many of you have, have, have heard of CRISPR mutagenesis, and you'll be aware that this is a sort of two-component system for experimentally introducing uh, mutations in cells. So this consists of a bacterial nuclease, Cas9, which you can program with a short guide RNA, um, which consists of the 20 nucleotide gene-specific region shown here in green, and this kind of hairpin scaffold region um, further down. And so when you have Cas9 complex with this uh, short guide RNA here, um, this will program Cas9 to sort of find the complementary sequence um, to this guide RNA in the target DNA, and Cas9 then introduces a double-strand break using its two nuclease domains um, at this target site. This, uh, this break is then repaired by the endogenous um, cellular DNA repair pathways, and in many, case, uh, many cases, this will eventually result in small insertions or deletions at the, um, at the target locus. So in this talk, um, we'll mostly be providing these, um, this Cas9 machinery in the following way. So the guide um, will be provided on a lentiviral construct using a U6 uh, polymerase 3 promoter to transcribe the, the guide from DNA. And the Cas9 is uh, going to be stably integrated in the cells in most of the applications I'll talk about. So we'll infect cells with this lentivirus. This will um, program the 
constitutively express Cas9. This would then go and cut its target site, um, on hopefully on both alleles, giving us a mutant cell. And when we're doing screens, uh, we'll actually use pools of lentiviruses designed to cut every gene in the genome. So this gives us a, a big pool of mutant cells with mutations in different genes, and we call this a mutant library. Uh, so this is what we can use as a starting point for our genetic screens. So this was the um, this was the first screen that I carried out for PARP inhibitor resistance. So we took uh, one of these guide uh, one of these mutant libraries. Um, this is a genome-wide library in mouse embryonic stem cells, and we have five guides per gene on average. So altogether, there are about a hundred thousand guides in this in this library. Uh, and just did a very very simple screen where you expose the cells to a high concentration of PARP inhibitor talatoprib. Uh, it's also known as BMN six seven three for six days. And this is at a concentration that would normally kill all of the wild type cells. So we just see what survives. Um, and in this case, we pick the colonies and then you do a PCR um, on the lentiviral construct, which is stably integrated in this colony to, um, and then we just sequence it to identify which guide RNA was present in these cells that survived. So this is what we found when we looked at the surviving cells in the screen. Uh, so normally when we're doing genetic screens, they uh, tend to because we've got five guides per gene in this library on average, uh, we'd normally look for multiple guides coming out in the resistant population, which will kind of give you some confidence that this is not um, you know, a random effect or an off-target effect of the, of the guides. Um, so as we kind of uh, expected from some of our earlier work, we saw a lot of PARP1 guides in the resistant cells um, from this screen. And we found two of the, to the five guides total in the library uh, and everything else that we found was only represented by a single guide. Um, so th this was this was kind of uh, th th this was expected to some extent, but when I went on to look at these mut mutants in a bit more detail, uh, we found something interesting. So, as you can see, uh, many of these mutants uh, lack PARP1 expression. Um, so th this is uh, this is what we expected. But there's one exception here, where even though this mutant uh, clone eight has a PARP1 guide, um, it's still expressing PARP1. So nevertheless, this clone 8 was uh, very resistant to all the PARP inhibitors that we tested um, when we retested it. And you can see its resistance is shown in purple on these survival curves here. Um, you can see that it's resistant to the same extent as a null mutant, which is shown in the green and uh, the red here. Um, so yeah, this is a clearly resistant mutation and it's got a PARP1 guide. So, so what's happening here? So we went on to like sequence the PARP1 target site in these in these clones, and this is just a PCR across the target site. And you can see in many cases, actually, you get quite large deletions at PARP1 in these clones. But in clone A, everything looked normal until we sequenced this. Um, and so actually, so here you can see the, um, the guide RNA sequence. So this is the target site. Uh, this is the PAM, which, um, is, which also specifies the target site for CRISPR. Uh, and you can see that we have just a deletion of three nucleotides at the um, target site in this, in this mutant clone. Uh, and you can see that happens on both alleles, and then we actually have a heterozygous substitution um, mutation as well. Um, so yeah, so it seems like this is an in-frame mutation, which explains why it's still expressing PARP1. So what's happening in this uh, mutant PARP1 protein? Um, so this this, um, this is deleting methionine 43 essentially, and then one of the um, one of the mutations is causing a substitution as well. Uh, and when we looked at some of the crystal structures um, of the PARP1 zinc finger DNA. Um, Binding domains bound to DNA. You can see that actually, this um, th these two residues that are affected in this mutant actually form a crucial interface between the two zinc finger um, domains. Uh, so, so, yeah, so it's possible that this mutation could disrupt the DNA binding activity of PARP1. Um, so that that was that was our hypothesis: is that you know this mutant might not be able to bind DNA, and therefore it might not become trapped on DNA, and uh, therefore we wouldn't see the toxicity associated with PARP inhibitors in, in, these, in these cells. So on this uh, slide, I'm showing the trapping assay that we do for PARP1. Uh, so this was developed by Yves Pommier's group. Um, so as you can see in wild type cells, when you add a PARP inhibitor, you see PARP1 becoming uh, associated with the chromatin fraction when you do a subcellular fractionation of the, the lysates in these cells. And this is all done in the presence of um, alkylation damage, which induces single strand breaks. Um, whereas in our mutant here, you can see that all the PARP1 is remaining in the nucleus soluble fraction, and we never see any trapped in the in the chromatin fraction. So it seems like in this case, uh, you know, we've isolated a point mutant in PARP1 that can't bind DNA, and that therefore doesn't show this trapping effect and isn't toxic to the cells in the presence of PARP inhibitor. So this is quite a nice. Um, I think this is quite a nice example of a CRISPR screen because by isolating a point mutant like this, you can really get directly to the 
the mechanism of action of PARP inhibitor drugs. So the next big question for us is, could PARP1 cause PARP inhibitor resistance in BRCA mutant cells? So this is um, this was always a, a um, experiment that I didn't think would necessarily work very well because we know that deleting PARP1 and deleting BRCA um, are synthetically lethal. So the cells should not tolerate um, the simultaneous loss of both of these proteins. But having seen some of these uh, point mutations coming out of the screen, I wondered if uh, some of these point mutations might be tolerated in the BRCA mutant cells. And so maybe this could be a, a mechanism of resistance, even though the BRCA mutant cells should be very sensitive to the loss of PARP1. Um, so, I, so I took a BRCA mutant cell line, a SAM149 breast cancer cell line, and we introduced the, the similar guide to, that we found from the screen, although this is now a human, targeting the human region of um, the, the orthologous region in human PARP1. Uh, and as you can see, that we, we see a really, really strong PARP inhibitor resistance phenotype uh, when we transfect the cells with this guide. Um, so clearly, the cells are able to um, tolerate PARP1 loss in this case and become resistant to PARP inhibitor. Um, and we were able to clone out. Uh, several like long-term resistant clones from this population. And while some of them did indeed have very, very similar mutations to the uh, the mutation that we isolated from our screen, some of them were actually complete nulls as well. So it turns out this doesn't even depend on having a point mutation here. Um, these cells were just able to, to tolerate the complete loss of PARP1. Uh, in a xenograph model, this also uh, held true. So uh, you can see here that while um, while the wild type xenografts respond to talosoprib and it improves survival, uh, the PARP1 mutant xenografts do not. So, um, yeah, so this was a question of why, why can these cells, why can these BRCA1 mutant cells tolerate PARP1? And we, we knew from kind of earlier experiments using kind of double RNAi experiments that these two things should be synthetically lethal. Um, so I kind of repeated some of these experiments, but including our PARP1 null uh, mutants that we identified from this screen. Uh, and what you can see from this experiment is actually, um, even in the PARP1 null mutant, uh, if we if we knock down BRCA1 and BRCA2, we still see this synthetic lethality that's quantified over here. So it seems like these cells, uh, even though they come from a BRCA1 mutant uh, patient, they still have some residual BRCA1 activity. And it seems like that is allowing them to tolerate this, this mutation in PARP1. Uh, and I have a hypothesis for this, um, which, uh, uh, is, is that there's a, a known splice variant of BRCA1 which skips exon 11, and that's where this frame shift mutation is in the SAM149 cells. Um, and it's known as well from some uh, some other functional work that these, this isoform of BRCA1 which skips exon 11 um, still gives some uh, homologous recombination activity to the cells. So this is our hypothesis. This was our hypothesis for why the cells were tolerating the loss of PARP1 in this case. Um, so to test that a bit further, we uh, use some of the other patient-derived cell lines we have in the lab. So in COF362, which is an ovarian cancer cell line with an exon 11 mutation, again, we were very easily able to um, isolate uh, pulp resistant clones with a PARP1 guide RNA. Uh, but in MDMB436 cells, which have um, an exon 20 splice site mutation, so it's not an exon 11, uh, we could only ever get a kind of transient resistance to talosoprib, and we were never able to isolate any long-term resistant clones from these cells. And in fact, when we sequence the target sites in these cells, we always see at least 50% um, of the reads, even in this transient population, have uh, have wild-type sequence. So it seems like the complete loss of PARP1 is not being tolerated in these cells. So this is important because um, I, I mentioned that we, we know that reversion mutations happen in patients that become resistant to PARP inhibitors. Um, and that's, we, we have a cell model of that as well, which is shown in red here. So this is the SUM149 cell line with the BRCA mutation reverted. And in blue, you can see our PARP knockout SUM149 clone. And you can see that actually this is much, this is even more resistant to PARP inhibitors than the revertant. Um, so the question is like, if, if we see mutation if we, if we see resistance emerging in patients by, by these mechanisms, would that, uh, make any difference to how we would treat the, treat the, the resistant patient. Um, so as you can see here, uh, this is showing the response to cisplatin in these same cell lines. Uh, and the revertent has be also become resistant to cisplatin. So platinum drugs also target homologous recombination deficiency to some extent. Um, but as, as you can see, the PARP mutant here, uh, it still retains the kind of wild type sensitivity to cisplatin, or maybe even a little bit more sensitive than the wild type. Uh, similarly, if you look at toporosomerase inhibitors in these lines, um, 
the revertent cell line has become cross resistant to these um, top isomerase inhibitors, whereas the PARP1 uh, mutants have actually become sensitive again. So this kind of suggests that knowing the mechanism of resistance in patients could be important for determining um, any future future treatment that occurs. So, um, so moving on to the next part, I, I was I was interested in this um, question of exactly which PARP1 mutations could cause resistance. So this uh, this diagram of the PARP1 structure here shows the approximate location of the guides that we use that were in our um, CRISPR library that we used to do the initial screen. So we have five guides, and as you can see, they're mostly towards the end terminus, and that's a function of most of these uh, CRISPR design algorithms will tend to design your guides towards the end terminus because these are thought to be more likely to productively knock out your gene. Um, but of course, obviously in part one, this actually misses the what many would regard as the business end of the molecule, which is the catalytic domain. Um, so I was wondering if, you know, as well as the zinc finger domain mutations that we already found, whether we'd find interesting mutations in the rest of part one that could also um, affect the function. Um, so yeah, this this is the guy that gave us the 45 um, Del M mutation, which had the zinc finger, which was the zinc finger DNA binding domain deficient mutant. Um, but yeah, I was worried if we might be missing interesting mutations in the rest of the gene. So I designed this other this dense part one library, which basically is just every possible guide that you can design across part one. Um, many of these may not be you know the best guides or the most active guides, but I, I was going really for the best possible coverage we could get of the PARP1 um, gene using CRISPR. Uh, so this is where um, the twist oligo pools really came in, in handy because uh, in the lab we know we're, we're making a lot of CRISPR libraries now. Um, and so, uh, yeah, u using, um, u using these oligo pools, you can easily sort of synthesize combinatorial, uh, combinatorial way um, lots mixtures of libraries very efficiently in one um, of these oligo pools. So per pool, you can get 72,000 oligos. This is only uh, sort of about 500. So we can do basically lots and lots of different libraries in a single pool. And uh, what we do is we just synthesize these. There are about 100 um, bases altogether. We have some PCR adapters, the cloning sites to put them into the lentiviral vector, and the guide RNA sequence in the middle here. Um, and so then what we do is we just, uh, for each library that we design in this pool, we do a a sort of library specific PCR with these um, PCR adapter sequences to convert this oligo to double stranded DNA and amplify it um, just a little bit out so we can purify it from the rest of the pool and then clone this into the lentiviral guide library. And this has proved to be a really efficient way of um, making lots of like highly customized libraries now, um, such as this one to just target part one. Um, and here you can see uh, we, ha we in the, I don't think in this case we sequenced the actual um, plasmid that we cloned it into, but this is sequencing cells that have been infected with the PARP1 dense uh, library that we made. Uh, and so you can see in most cases, we get a good representation of all the guides in the library. Uh, yeah, in this one, we missed a few um, at the cell stage, but you can see in this one, all the expected guides um, from our design were present in the library. And you can see from this, uh, the Gini index here, this means that a low Gini index means that the counts are, are very comparable in this case. So we have a good, um, representation, a good even representation of the guides in these libraries. So uh, the other part of this um, experiment to look at which kinds of mutations we could um, see giving resistance in part one was this cell line that we made. So uh, this is a someone for nine cell line which uh, carries a um, part one with a knock-in of uh, GFP into the endogenous part one locus. And we did this using the Chris Paint system. Um, well, I, did, I didn't put the reference here, but uh, you can look up the Chris Paint system, which is a very easy way to knock in um, tags into the C terminus of a gene of interest. Um, so yeah, in, in these cells, we have uh, part one GFP being expressed from one of the endogenous PARP, uh, PARP genes. And so some of the nine cells are a little bit um, aneuploid, so I think there were actually about five copies of PARP1 in these cells. Um, so then the idea is we could introduce our PARP1 guide library here and then select the cells for talazoprib resistance. So that means that we should get a loss of function of PARP1. And there's two possibilities for how that could occur. Either we'll get a complete knockout of all the um, all the PARP1 alleles in the cell and they'll become resistant to BMN, so if BMN is talazoprib. Um, or we could get mutations like we isolated from the screen that preserve the reading frame of PARP1. So these would be small, hopefully, in-frame deletions. Um, 
and these cells would still express the GFP. So um, yeah, so what we did was we put in our guide library, we selected in Talisoprib, and then we sort out GFP positive cells. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so this gives us resistant cells that still express in frame PARP1 GFP. Uh, and then what we do is we reverse transcribe from the GFP and sequence the PARP1 gene using amplicon sequencing. So this is um this is a yeah a diagram of the the PARP1 uh, gene again. You can see the the domain structure here, um, and this is again the positions of our guides along this side. So the outcome of this sequence experiment is re basically we call the mutations and we map them onto this onto the PARP1 sequence. Um, and so what you can see is we see some some interesting clusters of mutations occurring uh, in in this in this sequencing. So we're just basically plotting the the sequence the um, the frequency of mutations at each position all along this um, all along the PARP1 gene, whether these were deletions or or um, yeah deletions or insertions. So as you can as we kind of expected, we see clusters in the zinc finger dom domains. So zinc finger domain one, which is where we found the original mutation in the screen, also zinc finger domain two, lots of mutations. Um, then we don't see very many mutations in the BRCT domain, and that's sort of, I guess, consistent with what we what we know about the function of the BRCT domain. This is where the auto modification occurs, but it's probably not that important for the DNA repair functions of PARP1. Uh, and then we see a lot of interesting clusters in the WGR domain here, um, and also in the regulatory domain. And again, not very much in the catalytic domain. Um, except for this one sort of hotspot here, which is not the active site. Um, yeah, and, and again, this is probably um, expected to some extent because you'd expect mutations to disrupt the catalytic domain to result in constitutively trapped PARP1, which might be very toxic to the cells. Um, so the next thing we did was actually to map these frequencies and mutations onto the 3D structure of PARP1. Um, and here you can see really nice patterns. So if we look at the this, this um, crystal structure here with the zinc finger domain, with the zinc finger domains one and two bound to a single strand break, you can see that uh, on these 3D structures, we've colored the residues red uh, and sized them based on the frequency of mutations that were identified in the screen. So you can see actually that the frequency of mutations really nicely identifies the DNA binding interfaces of the zinc finger domains. Um, so we're not just seeing mutations occurring everywhere in the resistant population, they seem to be um, it, it seems to be these ones that actually contact the DNA that are really important. Um, and that, if we look at these other crystal structures, which include some of the other domains of PARP1 as well, uh, you can see that kind of also holds true for some mutations on this side of the WGR domain, which are also contacting DNA. And then we also see this big bundle of um, mutations in the middle of the WGR domain going through to the helical domain. Uh, and our hypothesis is that this is um, a very important region for transmitting the activation signal from DNA binding of part one, so it's sensor role in sensing DNA damage through to the catalytic domain, which is required for the DNA repair. Um, yeah, so this, I, I think this very nicely identifies the um, the key functional areas of the part one uh, in, for, for PARP inhibitor action. Um, and so the, the other side of this project is obviously we're very interested to see if part one mutations occur in resistant um, samples. And um, some of our collaborators uh, in Seattle, uh, Liz Fisher and, and Jungming Lee at the NCI, uh, had identified one mutation in um, a PARP inhibitor resistant patient from a phase one trial. This is an R591C mutation. So this is a missense mutation and it was kind of a variant of unknown significance. But when we mapped it onto our um, onto our mutation data from this screen, you can see that this R591C mutation really fell into one of these um, WGR domain clusters uh, that were highly mutated in the resistant population, suggesting that it might indeed uh, be very important for the function of, of PARP1 and for trapping. Um, and if you look at that on the 3D structure, again, you can see that R5.1C is really right in the middle of this um, this bundle that we, we think is involved in transmitting the signal um, to, to the catalytic domain. So yeah, that suggested that this R5.1C mutation uh, may actually be uh, deficient in trapping or in DNA binding. So uh, Drago Krasner, who's another postdoc in the lab, um, tested this using a micro irradiation assay. So in, in this assay, we shine a UV laser um, onto PARP1 GFP expressing cells uh, to make a little spot of DNA damage in the nucleus. And then using um, live microscopy, you can monitor recruitment of uh, GFP signal to this spot that you irradiate. So if we look at this graph here, um, in black, you can see the normal wild type 
uh, kinetics of part one binding. So part one comes on very, very fast within a second um, and then dissociates a little, a little more slowly as, you know, as DNA repair occurs. If we had talazovirib shown in the gray, part comes on and stays on. So this is the trapping effect, which you can see, see very clearly in this micro radiation assay. Uh, but if you look at the colored lines here, which are showing um, cells expressing a GFP fusion with the R5N1C mutant, um, you can see that although these do bind, they're not, they're, they don't, they're not stably bound at all. And both um, in the presence or absence of telosoprib, uh, these, these mutations quickly dissociate from the site of DNA damage. So this suggests that really these are not able to bind stably to sites of DNA damage and to activate PARP1 and mediate repair. Um, and also, you can see from this uh, graph that adding the talazoprib uh, doesn't cause trapping in these in these uh, in these mutants. So that yeah, so that really um, suggests that actually it is a trapping uh, DNA binding defect in this R5N1C mutation that might have been responsible for the lack of response to PARP inhibitor in this patient. So um, yeah, that's um, that's what I was going to say. So I just to remind, just to recap the talk here. Um, so I've uh, showing you that PARP1 DNA binding is really required for PARP inhibitor cytotoxicity. Uh, that's in both HR def proficient cells and also deficient cells. So um, this is shown by the isolation of PARP1 uh, loss of function and DNA binding domain mutations. Um, and yes, yeah, surprisingly, even in BRCA1 deficient cells, um, this was a possible mechanism of resistance. Uh, and that was because um, some of these pathogenic BRCA1 mutations um, will actually tolerate PARP1, PARP1 loss or PARP1 mutation uh, because they are, in fact, they, they seem to be hypermorphs. Um, and that's that's something that you can only see really when you use the patient-derived mutations for BRCA1. Um, if you if you try and do knockouts um, in BRCA1, you won't see PARP1 coming out as a mechanism of resistance. And again, this was shown recently in another in another genome wide screen we've done for PARP resistance, where if you use a a complete knockout um, pop, uh, BRCA1 model, you won't see PARP1 coming out as a, a mediator of resistance, presumably because it's lethal in this context. Um, and so uh, from the models that we isolated from these BRCA1 mutant cell lines, uh, we showed that actually the resistance is very distinct from the kind of resistance you get from uh, that occurs by reversion of the homologous recombination defect. Uh, so for example, we don't see this cross resistance to cystatin um, or to other um, DNA repair targeting drugs like top isomerase inhibitors. Uh, and yeah, finally, from this last part of the talk, um, I showed that although the zinc finger domains are very important um, in mediating DNA binding and trapping, uh, you could, there's actually several like significant clusters of mutations outside the DNA de binding domain that can also affect trapping and affect uh, resistance. Um, and we think those are involved in transmitting the activation signal to the catalytic domain. Uh, um, but there are also other interesting clusters here, which might be, um, which we're now interested in looking at further. Oh, and um, this most of this work I've talked about today is published in the references down here, so um, you can you can read about it if, if there's anything else um, that you're interested in. So uh, yeah, just to end by saying thank you to um, my hosts again here, uh, to Aspire Science and Bite Size Bio, uh, to everybody in the lab who helped with these experiments, to my PI Chris Lord, um, Drago Krastev, who's another postdoc who did. Um, who helped me with a lot of this work and um, did a lot of the micro radiation assays in particular. Um, Feifei Jess and Inga, who did a lot of um, cell culture and uh, model making involved in this project. I have to say a big thank you to our collaborators as well, um, Liz Swisher and Jungmin Lee, who um, analyzed their um, PARP inhibitor trial um, data for us um, to see if they could find any PARP, in, PARP 1 mutations. Uh, and finally, also to Kosuke Yusuf from the Sangam Institute, uh, now in Kyoto, uh, who provided us with the genome wide CRISPR library uh, and helped us out a lot. So um, thank you for listening, uh, and I'm happy to, to take any questions now from, from Amanda. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. That was an excellent presentation. We have a few questions from the audience. If anyone else has a question, please feel free to post it in the questions box that appears on the right of your screen. So our first question um, comes from Monica and they're asking about the reference for the GFP knock-in. Is that the reference that you were talking about on, I think it was just your last slide. Uh, yeah, um, the reference it's, uh, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but this is it's a nature communications paper and um, the system is called crisp paint. Uh, so okay. if you look up Chris Paint, you should be able to find it. Uh, so this it. this this works by introducing uh, by sort of you transfect uh, 
a, a plasmid with the tag in and also um, guides that cut the plasmid and cuts your target locus of interest and the integration occurs i think by non homework ascent joining into your target um into your target locus and um we see some locus specific effects on this but uh in many cases it seems to be very efficient and um, i think we had yeah it's and obviously it's very easy to see if it's worked or not because your cells go green um I love the title, Crisp Paint. So our next question is, are there PERP1 mutations that are seen in human cancer? Uh, yes, so, so PERP1 um, is not really an oncogene or a tumor suppressor gene in itself. Um, so you don't, you don't really see a lot of mutations um, in, in primary tumors. Um, and I don't think PARP1 is really involved in the development of tumors as such. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking for here really is acquired resistance um, in the most part. Uh, so surpri surprisingly, this R5N1C mutation that we looked at um, was actually a pre-existing somatic mutation um, in the cancer. And this was found before um, before the exposure to PARP inhibitors. This was in a phase one trial, and this patient was de novo re resistant to um, to PARP inhibitors. Um, so yeah, we're, we're really interested in looking more at acquired resistance samples to see if there are any mutations that um, occur during treatment. Um, yeah, because they don't seem to really be there in, in, in primary tumors. Okay, and then to follow that up, Monica asks if there's if you have any idea if there's any PERP1 inhibitors that are used in, say, pancreatic or other cancers. Uh, yes, yeah, so there are. I mean, there are PERP, there are PERP inhibitor trials um, involved in um, going on in, in several other cancer types. Now, mm -hmm. uh, pancreatic cancer is is one for sure. Um, yeah, pancreatic and also prostate cancer. Um, you know, any sort of in, in many cancers where you see uh, bracket one or bracket two defects or in okay. certain other DNA repair genes, that these are being considered as, as target populations for PARP inhibitors. Okay, and so our next question is, um, are there, okay, so are reversions the most likely cause of PARP inhibitor resistance? Um, yeah, so so far, um, it, reversions have been the main um, mechanism observed in the clinic. Uh, and I think there's, so yeah, I think there's several reasons for that. Uh, mm -hmm. First is I think, in a lot of cases, people only look for reversions because um, common kind of tumor sequencing panels will will include things like BRCA1 and BRCA2, okay. uh, but they won't include things like PARP1 because this is not an oncogene or a tumor suppressor gene, so it doesn't generally appear on these panels. Um, and yeah, the, the other thing is uh, I've showed in this talk that the reversions also cause cross resistance to cisplatin in particular. And in many oh. cases, patients um, on PARP inhibitor trials have been heavily pretreated with cisplatin, particularly in ovarian cancer and also increasingly mm -hmm. in breast cancer as well. So it's possible that resistance is actually developed in response to the platinum treatment, but then also applies to the PARP treatment. So it's only really now we're getting um, PARP inhibitors beginning to be used in early stage trials. So I'm interested to see if there's going to be any differences in the resistance mechanisms we see if PARP inhibitors end up being used before platinum, for example. Yes, and so I think that kind of um, leads into, or that might have answered my next question, or the next question that we have um, about are PARP1 mutations a potential cause of resistance and other PARP inhibitor sensitive backgrounds? Uh, yeah, potentially. So um, it's been, uh, I think one one setting that has been shown in is in Ewing sarcoma cell lines. So Ewing sarcoma mm -hmm. cells are sensitive to PARP inhibitors um, due to a, a due to these um, EWSR1 fusions that occur in Ewing sarcoma. Uh, and, you know, these, these probably do induce some kind of molecular combination defect, but it's somewhat distinct from the BRCA defects. Uh, but knocking out PARP1 in these cell lines does um, cause resistance. So I think, um, I think, I think provided the cells will tolerate the loss of PARP1, um, th this will be a cause of resistance because um, it, it, it's, it's acting very sort of close to the drug, if you see what I mean. The, Yes. Deleting PARP1 is really preventing the toxic lesion from ever occurring. It's not about mm -hmm. how cells deal with it. So it's a very kind of um, upstream uh, yeah. cause. Uh, yeah. And then I believe our last question about um, is, is it necessary to use the GFP fusion when conducting focused screens? 
Uh, yeah, so we used it to kind of as a kind of trick to make our life um, easier in this case <laughs> because um, you can kind of sort out the the in frame fusions and enrich your um, enrich right. your resistant population for those. But I don't I don't think it is necessarily uh, going to be um, the case. I mean, you could you could just filter out your in frame mutations of interest bioinformatically. Um, mm -hmm. Recently, we've also been using some of the CRISPR editing enzymes, um, which cause missense mutations rather than deletions. And again, in that case, um, you might be able to get away with that. Uh, but one, one thing you do have to do in this situation is knock out all the alleles of PARP1 because we know even one um, PARP1 allele in the cell will be sufficient for okay. the cell to be vulnerable to the PARP inhibitor. So, oh, right, you just need one, okay. Yeah, so th so in this so in this case, the GFP also helps because we can only look at, we make sure we only look at the GFP allele and we, we check yeah, and we assume that all the rest have been knocked out. And actually, in some of the clones we isolated, we have checked that, and we do see that all the other uh, alleles in the cell have accumulated loss of function mutations. That makes sense. Well, fantastic. So that looks like that brings us to the end of the webinar. So thank you again, Stephen, for a very illuminating presentation and a great uh, question and answer session. Thank you. And thanks also to our sponsor, Twist Bioscience. And finally, thanks to you, the audience, for taking the time to attend and listen in. If you've enjoyed the webinar and would like to view the video recording of the session, please visit the webinars page on bitesizebio.com. It should be available within the next 24 hours. And there, you can also see the other webinars we have lined up for you on Bite Size Bio. So until next time, good luck in your research, and goodbye from all of us at Twist Bioscience and Bite Size Bio.